Hi, folks, it's time to get started. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the MIT Robotics Seminar. Um, I'm very happy today to introduce our speaker, Professor Sunjo Chang. Sunjo is the brand professor of Control and Dynamical Systems at Caltech, and is also a senior research scientist at JPL. So Sunjo received his master and PhD degree from MIT Aero Astra, not far like, you know, uh, from us here. And before joining Caltech, he was also a faculty at UIUC. His research focuses on uh, distributed spacecraft systems and space robotics, and in particular on the theory and application of control, estimation, and learning to navigation problems arising in autonomous uh, space and air vehicles. He got many, many awards. Uh, just to mention a few, uh, he got the UIUC Engineering Dean Award for Excellence in Research, the FOSR Young Investigator Award, the NSF Career Award, uh, three Best Conference Papers Award, five Best Students Paper Award. I can keep going for a while here. Um, something that I want to mention is that uh, also his work got uh, recognition and got uh, extensive media coverage. For instance, one of his robots, uh, Robobot, I think it's called, uh, was displayed in a special exhibit at the Museum of Arts and Crafts in Hamburg in Germany, which is pretty cool. Finally, uh, Sunju is also an associate fellow of uh, AIAA, so please join me in welcoming him. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much for the invitation. And, uh, it's great to be back at MIT, and especially uh, uh, my dear colleagues and also my former PhD advisor, Zhang Jiak, here. So um, I'm going to share some of my recent research uh, with my research group. And as the title says, I'm going to emphasize particular technique or viewpoint when you actually work on uh, robotic learning and control. So hopefully you know what this contraction means. <laughs> um, I don't think we, I'll have a lot of time talking about this. This is a spacecraft simulator, basically can simulate the frictionless uh, dynamics of a spacecraft. And this hammer here is basically uh, asteroid model, by the way. Where? It's out of place. Yeah, that's <laughs> um, So some key messages. Uh, number one, um, I'm going to talk a lot about the machine learning based method. And I think there is a maybe you have to ask why you need a machine learning. So I'm going to show you some of the successful results from my group. In my opinion, then I think the one of the best use cases is the basically trying to have this like representation power, adaptation power using machine learning. But the thing is that, okay, you can have a more flexible system, uh, maybe estimating certain uh, challenging parameters like a, a wind disturbance, but you have to actually make sure that this system black box doesn't cause trouble, right? Because it's just black box. So that's why I think we need to have some more guarantees, mathematical guarantees. A lot of people in control, robotics, and machine learning people uh, community are talking about that, so I I'm going to present my own view, uh, I mean, that's shared by a lot of researchers here, uh, what's important in terms of guaranteeing this uh, stability and safety. Uh, so that's essentially contraction theory. Another key word is actually is that empowered by this kind of contraction kind of uh, stability viewpoints, we can also create the more complicated kind of a uh, layered architecture of control and planning, and I mean, it's not new, so that's hierarchy, hierarchical uh, connection. So what's the difference? We recently had a lot of advances in machine learning, and one thing I want to mention here is that, yes, this is a great, impressive work, including drone racing, and of course, the uh, AlphaGo, AlphaZero uh, beating human Go champion. But the, for example, like uh, some of the uh, early part, the key difference is that they are essentially uh, applying, being applied to finite uh, space of uh, action and state and also finite grid because it's a go game or board game or video game, right? Or you don't really have a disturbance. Like uh, you have to think about this computer video game or uh, known environment. You are doing high speed racing. And we are not really considering the external disturbance you might have in the real world. So that's something we are considering. And these days, actually, we are also um, taking into account a lot of um, failure scenarios. What if there is a failure, software failure, hardware failure? So that's what we are focusing on. And also, speed. High speed is important. So the, and also another word is that agility. 
So what kind of agility we are talking about? What kind of disturbance we are talking about? This is a Kaltech uh, drone lab. Um, I mean, this is a conventional drone lab, semi indoor outdoor space, but we have this uh, disturbance generator. It's a, like a gigantic wind uh, disturbance, and you can see that uh, my PhD student, Michael O'Connor, is having a difficulty uh, holding this umbrella. And that's like about 45 kilometers per hour, like a mild gale speed. And we have uh, this AI-based machine learning control algorithm that can kind of fight and deal with this kind of a heavy unknown wind disturbance. So that's what we are focusing on. Like a robustness and I mean, um, resiliency against the real world disturbance and failures. Uh, another example is that flying humanoid. So you can mention, uh, pay attention to the, was posted in April 1st. So I will uh, leave it there. But they want to build the basically flying humanoid <laughs> robot. And actually, in fact, we have developed such a robot. It's called the Leonardo. So it was on the, um, um, oh, no. I spoiled it. <laughs> and so this is the world's first uh, uh, bipedal robot that can fly, of course. But essentially, we are using uh, propellers to stabilize it. Because we have as propellers, it can also uh, fly. An interesting problem of this kind of a flying bipedal robot or any flying robot with uh, multiple legs is that how you synchronize propulsion system with um, lag uh, um, uh, placement and control. So that's an interesting problem we looked at. And what's really uh, more about the hardware uh, innovative mechanical design exercise, it doesn't really have a sophisticated machine learning control. But I can tell you that it has. You can see the supplemental material for science robotics paper. We have used contraction theory-based nonlinear tracking controller that guarantees the bounded input, bounded output um, with a, uh, external disturbance. That was the, one of the key uh, contributions. So that's the, one of the main topics. Contraction is important. And since I'm in uh, MIT, um, I heard about this uh, uh, quadruped and it can going over the uh, stairs and traversing stairs and wheels robot cannot do that. But think about this. This Leonardo robot on uh, Caltech campus is, uh, wants to start walking and then recognize these obstacle stairs and it can just fly over. I think that's also a solution for this kind of walking robot uh, or any uh, locomotion vehicle. And then it makes graceful landing and in terms of uh, synchronizing the like, right joint angles of the legs and then foot sensor. And it can stop. And this is the first bipedal robot, by the way, on high heels. Uh, so it can actually stop the motor and it can stabilize using four contact points. So this is a busy slide. I'm going to show you this slide a lot of times, but essentially, this is nothing new here. Essentially, what I'm talking about is that in the control and robotics control over control community, we have a motion planning in aerospace that's called the guidance, robotics in the planning, and we do path planning, motion planning. And you compute the desired trajectory. And um, we have to have a tracking control. And then you can add some new components like learning and offline learning. My key point here is that don't try to combine all of these. I mean, especially if you're doing reinforcement learning that you compute them desired the path and sending that directly to the actuator. The problem with that is that how are you going to guarantee the stability and stability? And in fact, actually, there are a lot of discussion on safety. My favorite approach to safety question is that essentially handle that in both motion planning, because if you're doing optimal control, you will be doing a lot of uh, inequality constraints, like uh, safety constraints, collision avoidance. You can handle that easily. But dynamics are not actually correct. Then you have to make sure that you can update the model based on whatever information you have. And you have to make sure that you can track that desired trajectory in the presence of uh, learning errors and disturbances. That's my favorite approach of uh, handling safety. So going back to the uh, Leonardo robot, obviously, um, I mean, I'm just saying that there are multiple loops even for this simple robot. I talked about multiple loops of uh, uh, lag control, optimization of gate planning, and stabilization running at uh, much faster 200 hertz. So there are multiple hierarchical loops and uh, running, and that's the key. You have to have a multiple loops. And obviously, before I show uh, Andy Leonardo part of the talk, I have to show this uh, um, video of uh, poking the robot using a stick. 
and it can actually slide and stabilize it. So this is an embodied pendulum, very well made control system. And again, we have used a nonlinear tracking controller using contraction. So we can still achieve that, but still it's not learning something new, uh, something unknown. And another idea of this hierarchical combination is that it's based on my prior work and some of that work with the Zhang Jack. Using the central pattern generator, artificial kind of a, um, mathematical model, you implement that as a coupled nonlinear oscillator to generate the low level control signal so that you don't have to control, for example, a bass to have a 36 joints, and then you don't want to kind of micromanage all these joint angles. You have a, this central pattern generator that generates the rhythms, and just you can modulate the phase difference. That's what brain does. So this is hierarchically combined nature of a fast loop, intermediate loop, and slow loop, there might be multiple loops between them. That's actually quite important. And people know that, but I just wanted to emphasize one more time. And so the hierarchical combination is the, uh, one of the key ideas. And again, um, as a reminder, uh, reinforcement learning is getting a lot of attention in the robotics community. But I want to remind you that some of the key theorems and convergence results, and especially like a Bellman equation, kind of associated with this kind of optimality of um, some of the uh, deterministic, uh, not deterministic, uh, discretized decision-making problem using Markov decision process. It's essentially an optimal control problem. In some sense, simpler. Because if you look at the optimal control problem, you typically have a highly nonlinear dynamics you have to deal with. And now this is a swarm problem, so you have multiple agents. And then you have a bunch of different constraints, like a safety constraints, input constraints, and you have to solve that in real time. So as a kind of reminder, we have kind of a numerical approach of this um, complex multi-agent robotic control problem. We actually uh, have a way to simplify this one using a successive linearization that's a convexification, and also some convexification of a collision avoidance using hyperplane, like you see there. And then we can solve this one in real time to do something like this. So you can actually reconfigure a large number of agents without prescribed like a target terminal points. And the objective is that along with the target assignment, that's another example of a hierarchical combination. You give a high level command, why don't you make a shape, U, I, U, C, alphabet shape. And they, whatever initial conditions, they actually can reconfigure themselves without collision, and then they can dock. And obviously, we actually have a real time validation of this reconfiguring the spacecraft simulators and um, then eventually they collide only at the desired point, which means the docking to uh, generate a more complex structure in space. So what's new? That has been done, and a lot of people are using sequential complex programming, and you can also rerun that as a modern predictive control fashion due to motion planning. See, that's my favorite approach, but there are two problems. Number one, there might be stochastic noise, and uncertainty can be captured as a noise problem. So we actually have a... That's not the only solution, I guess, but we just recently published in the transactions on robotics how you handle the both nonlinear stochastic dynamics. And people have done that for linear dynamics, perturbed by stochastic noise. But what if you have a inequality constraints, like a safety constraints or collision avoidance constraints? In probability, it's called the chance constraints. So we have to have a successive kind of approximation. Number one is the generalized polynomial chaos kind of approximation so that you can turn the uh, stochastic nonlinear dynamics to the deterministic nonlinear dynamics. And then, of course, you have to convert the original chance constraints into the new domain. Um, then, uh, then, essentially, you apply SCP. And that approach has been successfully applied uh, uh, to actually as a method of a stochastic motion planning where you have a huge uncertainty in terms of uh, location of your vehicle also or location of your obstacles. And some experimental results are validating this in the spacecraft simulator in my group. So going back to this equation, now we talked about some of the motion planning we can do, and we consider some uncertainty. And one thing I'm not going to talk about is that once you learn the uh, model here, we don't assume that everything is unknown. For example, we assume that there are certain parts of the dynamics are unknown. unknown. Uh, I'm going to tell you why that's my favorite approach. Anyway, you can pass that information, and then you can update your learning and motion planning in real time so that make sure that it's optimal and also safe with respect to the more true dynamics. 
But if you want to apply some learning-based approach to motion planning, we have that solution. So this is a, a also pretty well-known work in the RoboSwarm community. It's called the GLASS. And it's basically a combination of a localized and decentralized small neural networks that can actually output and approximate numerically uh, optimized, convex optimized solution so that you don't really have to compute this convex optimization, whether it's a sequential convex optimization or not. Uh, you just do a function evaluation, which is a lot more uh, computationally efficient. And it's trying to kind of mimic a fully centralized solution uh, with um, uh, global optimality using this kind of decentralized solution. The challenge here is that you have to have a neural network that's kind of a, a permutation invariant. And so we had to use the term technique called the deep set and some experimental validation. Uh, of course, we have a safety filter that can kind of correct for additional errors coming out of a neural network. So in my opinion, that's another good application of neural network. In addition to have this adaptation power to learn something very complicated to, uh, to model, like a, a wind-based disturbance or friction model of your tire, uh, you can actually use neural network um, to reduce the computational burden for small drones like this. So that's one good application a use case of a machine learning base. Um, one idea is that this kind of a, a sequential convex programming and so on, it didn't really have an adversarial kind of a game uh, competition. And so this is one paper that I uh, wrote uh, in terms of um, herding large number of uh, natural uh, real birds. So uh, birds tend to flock around the airport. And using a drone, we can kind of uh, scare. And if you kind of penetrate the swarm, it might actually worsen the uh, problem because you are going to spread the swarm. So you have to gently control the centroid and size of your swarm. So in this example, you have to have a competition. So, um, so in this case, we actually came up with the idea that you know, Monte Carlo tree search and then alpha one, alpha zero sped up that kind of tree-based decision uh, making basically using the neural network approximation of a policy function and value function. But that works on grid discretized word, not continuous dynamics. It doesn't really handle dynamics. So we came up with an idea how you can actually uh, apply the continuous dynamics in addition, um, more like a continuous word uh, for drone uh, uh, control problem. So this is one ex explanation. We have uh, experimental validation where the three drones are competing with um, uh, the other three uh, drones, red one, to kind of uh, uh, defend that area. So you have um, trees that are running fast in adaptive fashion, but it has a limited complexity. But neural network is slow, but not cheap, uh, can uh, achieve much more complex behavior. So I'm kind of uh, uh, quoting the very famous book. Even for the not control loop, low level control, high level decision making, even within decision making, you have a multiple fast loop and slow loop, and you can mix those to actually have a better performance. And this is a kind of a next extension. So I think we are very excited about, instead of using the um, optimization or model predictive control, using the tree-based approach. Um, but the previous existing approach um, didn't really guarantee the true optimality. And there's a kind of scaling issues. And so we, I think that we kind of solved the problem. So one, um, I'm going to just skip here. And this is a DAPA uh, learning introspective uh, control project and uh, where this uh, tracked vehicle has a uh, track degradation, unknown degradation. They, they intentionally modify control signal. And then the, um, it might actually go through the very tight corners. And the nice thing about this Monte Carlo tree search is that um, in the sequential convex program, you have to initialize the very uh, good path. Otherwise, you get stuck and local optimal. But this one, you can even back up and it has this exploration aspect in addition to the exploitation. So it has to actually work very nicely as our default motion planner competing with a um, sequential convex programming. So I just wanted to mention that. And that's not the uh, whole thing. I was only talking about desired trajectory generation. This one, if you don't have a tracking control, you are not going to track in the presence of this tracking error. I mean, degradation and failures and like unknown friction models and moving pendulum changing the center of mass, 
you are not going to achieve that safety and then tracking performance. So that's why you need to focus on tracking problem. You cannot get rid of it. And that's still my uh, suggested approach. Instead of trying to combine everything, and there we actually need to analyze the contractions. That's the uh, main method I was trying to say uh, when I say all you need in global learning is contraction. So um, obviously, uh, the contraction is a new way of looking at stability, and um, essentially by Zhang Zhang and uh, Winnie. Uh, and then we also recently uh, published uh, uh, annual reviews in control tutorial paper, and we gave, gave a tutorial session in CDC. So you can still watch some of the videos there. And essentially, we are trying to bridge the gap in the uh, neural network or machine learning based representation power and more stability guarantees. Because if you put a robot box, a black box, and to do some smooth landing of your drone, uh, accounting for some unknown disturbance, how are you going to guarantee the stability? Because it's just input, and you don't really know what's going to happen in the output especially if you go outside the training domain. So I also want to mention that there is a still clear difference. And if you are doing a control, it's kind of obvious. But I think that it's time for me to emphasize again. Don't assume that your actual trajectory coming from the robot is the same as or close to the, your desired motion. It's not. So you have to guarantee that try to minimize that. So that's a conventional tracking problem, but you have to do a lot more than just conventional tracking problem using learning and so on. Another thing that I want to mention is that you might actually have a, a disappeared, yes. Safety thing, uh, there are that popular approaches like a control barrier function and so on. My favorite approach is that do you really take into account this collision avoidance constraint in motion planning? Because if you just combine everything and then you assume that that's a control input, there is something you will uh, lose in terms of uh, performance and actual safety. What you have to do is that you have to really consider safety as a tracking problem. And in my opinion, if you achieve that safety using desired tracking performance so that you take into account whatever errors you might have, that's how you handle safety. So safety, in my opinion, is a subset of a stability robustness question. It's not separate. They should not compete with each other. And you might actually have to do that. So uh, this is a busy slide. If you know the linear stability theory, um, conventional way of looking at stability is that just looking at the stability of an equilibrium point. So what's new in the contraction theory is that more generalization. Because in the robotic system, you have a trajectories, not just trajectories in the robot control. For estimation, you have to do what you have to do is that estimate your true trajectory unknown and try to minimize the, the difference between true trajectory and then estimated value out of your observer or filter. So that's also incremental stability. So incremental stability is the stability of multiple trajectories. As I said earlier, because when you have a multiple hierarchical system, uh, using conventional method of a passivity, it might be more involved to analyze the hierarchical combination. But as you can see, this is a kind of triangular system because it looks like almost linear system as a function of a linear system of a virtual displacement. So that virtual displacement, I'm going to define that later, is the infinitesimal change. And if that stability can be guaranteed, you have an exponential convergence. Just quickly, compared to the Lyapunov function of a conventional Lyapunov function, it can be any Lyapunov function of nonlinear Lyapunov function as long as it's actually a positive function and so on. And then with a V dot. Uh, negative, what's interesting is that contraction theory is always quadratic function. It's easy. You don't have to guess like uh, using, like uh, I heard some of like uh, scale, uh, some of the scales, some um, neural network. You don't have to do that. It's always quadratic function. And what you have to do is not free. You have to focus on finding this M matrix, positive definite. It's called the Riemannian metric. You have to find this metric function. So that's the new stuff. So that's the M. And in fact, that's like basically a transformation of your original infinitesimal at the same time. It's the same delta uh, you see from the optimal control theory calculus of variation. So at delta Z, which is actually transformed delta X, is going to zero or single trajectory. So delta X or delta Z is going to zero exponentially fast than 
every single trajectory from whatever initial conditions are converging to the single trajectory exponentially fast, provided that you satisfy this condition. That's the essence of a contraction theory. And then you can actually generalize that so that you can have a quadratic function. You can actually, in fact, propose your Lyapunov function is the actual path length. So then that's another thing. They are kind of um, related by inequality. So as long as you can prove that one of them actually is converging, you can prove that delta x is converging. And by comparison lemma, you see it's an exponential. If you don't have an inequality, it's a v dot minus 2 alpha v. It's a scalar function. It's exponential. This is a known result in uh, uh, nonlinear stability theory. But again, the difference is that we are constructing this in terms of delta x or delta z, infinitesimal virtual vector. Okay. So then you can prove that the whatever path trajectory will converge exponentially fast. Why this is useful for machine learning based control? We can further generalize that to the any unknown true model. And the, you have a learned model. Whatever difference can be viewed as a disturbance or combination of disturbance or learning error. And you make an effort to estimate that upper bound. And it can be very conservative. You make an effort to further reduce that. But still, with the provided, um, with the assumption that you have a disturbance here or learning error, you can actually prove the exponential convergence from whatever initial condition is exponential with a contraction rate alpha. And they are going to converge. So this initial condition will disappear exponentially fast. That's what I said, the exponential forgetting of the initial conditions. And they are going to left with um, whatever disturbance or learning error. If that learning error is zero or there is no disturbance, it's going to perfectly converge to zero to each other. And then I want to remind you that this kind of reminiscent of exponential stability and upper bound and lower bound, and that's one of the key things you need to have. It's a known result in the reaction of exponential stability. Another thing I want to mention is that it's not just about vector norm. You can actually apply that to the signal norm. So it's, you can guarantee that for LP signal, or L2, you can actually prove that it's a, a, a finite gain L2 stable, which is actually beautiful. So essentially what we are trying to say is that it's much easier to say bounded input, bounded output, or even input to state stability uh, against the bounded disturbance. And then what about the uh, discrete time system? Same thing. So remember, if you don't have a theta, which is actually scale root of this uh, metric function I talked about, and then essentially, that's an essential contraction mapping that you are familiar with. That's not, I mean, that's what you are trying to say. But what's new in contraction theory is that opportunity to generalize that you can explore different kind of a contracting property, even if original Jacobian is not smaller than one, which you, you need for uh, exponential stability for discrete time system. And furthermore, you can go ahead and apply that to the perturbed system. Same thing. It's very similar to the, this. Now your alpha should be smaller than 1. And then as alpha and k goes to infinity, this uh, will disappear. Your initial error will disappear. And then you'll have a steady state error. Same thing. But the, what's new here is that, again, exploring, exploring the kind of a generalization of a, this contraction metric um, as opposed to the single identity metric. So it's more general, and that's very similar to contraction mapping you are familiar with um, in some of the um, uh, convergence analysis. And in fact, I'm going to say that in the reinforcement learning and conventional value iteration and policy iteration, whatever convergence results rely on gamma smaller than 1, whether gamma is coming from discounting factor or uh, learning rate. Same. And then what I'm saying is that for discrete time case, your k is now, now not time, but it's over iteration. Because now, whenever you uh, use the deep learning, supervised learning, you're using the training of your neural network, whether it's a convolutional neural network, and so on, you are using gradient descent. Or more precisely, stochastic gradient descent. And that's a gradient descent. You can see that that's the, exactly the model we are using in contraction. You can analyze the convergence of this. And then it has a relationship to the policy gradient, essentially, because you are iterating over the policy. And then I'm going to mention that, loosely speaking, that has a very strong connection to the adaptive control method we are doing. 
And so this is a known result, textbook results maybe. Um, if you have a gradient descent, if you have an additional assumption, remember that I have a Lyapunov function upper and low bounded uh, with a, a kind of a quadratic function of a, a norm. Same thing, if you have a strongly convex uh, cost function, you now have an upper bound and lower bound, and you can actually prove the exponential convergence of the, your favorite training method, which is the gradient descent. So this is a known result. And then one, I'm saying that we have a similar result. We are applying that to the uh, factor graph optimization distributed. So we are using uh, local consensus ADMM. And we are using the same analysis to prove the exponential convergence, assuming that cost function is uh, strongly convex. OK? Then what if you have now stochastic dynamics and the same thing? We have extended that. Actually, uh, Zhang Jack did the first. And we have somewhat generalized that so that uh, your metric function could be also a function of a state. So good news is that expected value of the mean squared error could be exponentially bounded, because everything is a stochastic, right? Whether it's a small or not, it's a perturbed. So whatever distance between A and B, and A could be desired motion, B could be your actual motion, or A could be your true state, and B could be your estimation state, they are going to converge if you can prove this provided that. And another thing is that in this paper, we slightly extended that. And then you can actually have a, instead of doing Jacobian over nonlinear system, because we are doing nonlinear control and nonlinear estimator, hopefully they can do better than extended Kalman filter. We actually showed that. Here, I will just want to remind you that we have this state dependent coefficient for, this is kind of a semi-linearization. So f of x can be written as a, a of x and x. But the problem is that there are so many a of x's, and you have a nice, Super, uh, convex combination of this, and you're optimizing over low vector. So that's in the paper. And this is kind of reminiscent of some of the last layer deep neural network adaptation that I'm going to talk about. This is actually the highlight of my talk. Deep last layer adaptation, why is it so important? It's kind of similar to that. And then here we are kind of uh, Further, Hiroyasu actually further simplified that as a convex problem. So your stability condition of a metric M dot is actually uh, given as a uh, um, LMI, and you have to solve that in real time. And then you're minimizing what? The steady state error. So this is a completely different uh, view from um, H infinity control or, uh, um, or Kalman filter. We are minimizing only steady state error that will not disappear. Non-vanishing error. So this is a one way of computing metric that I talked about. Because I told you, other than existing results of uh, exponential stability, what's really new is the computing the metric so that you can explore multiple possibilities of uh, seemingly not exponential, uh, uh, exponentially stable dynamics. So it's more general. But the problem is that you have to solve it numerically every time instant. So another extension is that you sample it offline, and it's called a neural contraction metric. So instead of coming up with a completely neural network-based uh, function, we consider some whatever training error and so on. But then you can actually <laughs> represent a metric M as a neural network. So that's called a neural contraction metric that was published in the CSL uh, control system letters. So I talked about the motion planning and some of the contraction analysis. And finally, anyone can design the robust controller. But I'm going to talk about adaptive control method based on machine learning, and then uh, with uh, some safety stability guarantees from contraction analysis so that you can further reduce tracking errors that you do uh, have just using robust control. So adaptive control is useful because you can further reduce it. Again, as a reminder, my favorite approach about Con handling safety is that you compute the desired motion that's safe and then focus on in realistically with all this bound assumption and whatever estimate you have or learning based uh, system, you can actually reduce that error. So even with the uh, uh, tracking errors, you can still be safe. That's my favorite approach for tracking. So again, uh, safety. So safety problem is not really different from tracking. It's not separate. So it was just published in CDC last year. So if you have just conventional tracking, and um, you might actually see that you might actually disobey the safety in the presence of 
modeling errors and disturbance because you didn't really take into account and or you are considering that a sep separate reappearance function. So you're checking the stability and checking the log barrier function for um, uh, safety. Instead of doing that, what you are trying to do is that you view this as a tracking control problem as a using contraction theory. And even if you have a learning error, you learn the trajectory and your desired trajectory highlighted here is still within the safety bounds. So that's what uh, we are trying to show. So the problem of the conventional like uh, control, re the upper of control barrier function is that you are really based on this stability of the safety set. So maybe somehow you have a disturbance and so on. You might actually have a high pulling force to bring it to the safety set. It might actually saturate, uh, so um, uh, it might actually cause some problem there. Instead, uh, we are doing incremental stability. So we are trying to track that and then we guarantee safety along, you see this uh, cup there? It's safety is guaranteed as a tracking control problem along the trajectory here. So if you are interested in this method of um, safety guarantees, uh, that's a CDC paper 2023 called CART. So finally, adaptive control, as a kind of a, um, background information, um, I'm looking at the flying vehicle because I think this is actually that fan array uh, in the fly array. Then you can actually fly like a fixed wing because we have a high speed wind and then you can actually have 1,296. I told you, 1,296 individual computer fans that can be individually controlled. So you can actually perturb one, one part of the wing if you want to. Uh, so this is a disturbance generator. And then we show the nice transition performance. So that's the adaptive control without any machine learning. So what we are trying to do here that we can do further improvement using neural network. That's what we have shown. So this is a kind of so-called neural fly, neural lander family. We started with a neural lander. And then the most latest work is that science robotics paper can kind of show that it can actually handle unknown state independent. I emphasize it's not velocity and position because landing is actually a, a function of a position with respect to the ground. Independent of those states, uh, states you have an external wind disturbance. When you fly in the air, uh, airplane, you all of a sudden experience turbulent air. So that's actually completely independent. And furthermore, latest extension that was just uh, uh, published, uh, accepted for LAL is that now we can even handle the full tolerance in real time. So what's actually what we are talking about very fast? The first work is in neural lander, no online adaptation, just it has a state information in real time in the sense of feedback. So I told you about the importance of a contraction and how you actually guarantee the contraction. It's not about just estimating the bound. When you train the neural network, it's actually a very well-known technique in the recurrent neural network. But we are the first one that used this method for nonlinear control design. When you train the neural network, it's called the spectral normalization. You actually compute the Lipschitz constant, which is basically slope of your black box, and then keep normalizing it so that you can actually bound your slope. What's important is actually is not the actual size of your bound, which might not be bounded. The, you need to just bound the slope. And we are nonlinear control expert. You say information, you just compute the gain for nonlinear control that can dominate that slope. And then the out I mean, the resource is actually quite powerful. In addition to have a better um, landing performance, because for example, like uh, it's going over the table and experience the uh, ground effect. Ground effect is the, with the, the uh, interaction with the ground and you get the not only X, Y, Z force and you can actually have a disturbance. In fact, we actually went outside the training domain. So you landed the aircraft faster than your training data and it has the ge nice generalization power as opposed to the case where you didn't use a spectral normalization. So whenever you use a neural network, it has confirmed by my students and other research groups many, many times, always do spectral normalization. Otherwise, you're not doing correctly. And use the information to design the stabilizing contracting controller. Obviously, extension is that you are getting this aerodynamic disturbance from the swarm interaction because they are blowing the air to each other. So this is the closest proximity flight using this um, uh, crazy flyer, small drones, but we have a bigger ones, heterogeneous. And then we estimate the uh, aerodynamic interaction and then we correct for that. The only big technique 
totality error, obviously, I have to show this drone show there. Another example of uh, showing this is my, our spacecraft lab. Is that you have to have a, like a neural network kind of um, doesn't care about the actual number, index number of your neighbors, because that should be permutation invariant. So essentially, we use this technique called uh, a deep set. So that's maybe one technicality that I, I want to add here. So then finally, what is a neural fly? D, G, and I want to mention that you are, you know the rigid body dynamics of a drone. And of course, you don't know perfect parameters of a disturbance and whatever uh, small force you can have. OK, but you know completely what you have is a bipedal robot. I want to just start from the scratch, and I have a simulation model. I'm going to just use a deep reinforcement learning. I don't think it's a good approach. Rather, we can focus on what we don't know. And what we don't know is that we already know the rigid body dynamics of a drone. And maybe you can have a flexible appendages, and you can approximate that. And then whatever modeling error, here it could be ground effect disturbance or whatever wind-based disturbance. It's better to focus on that, and it can be viewed as a rigid neural learning. Then the problem is that when you have a wind-based disturbance, which is actually as a parameterized as a W, that's an independent of state. It's just coming um, um, from nowhere, right? You don't know when it's going to blow the wind, heavy wind, or time-bearing wind. So there is a need to adopt this neural network representation to predict the wind-based disturbance, and that's a neural fly. And anyone can redesign and retrain the neural network. There are multiple questions you can ask. You collected the, well, actually, this is very efficient. You only had to fly 12 minutes, and that's it for this drone. It's not really that heavy. But let's assume that somehow you had to actually collect two hours or two days, and you only flew five seconds, or you only flew five minutes with some new wind profile. How do you know that? You have to retrain the whole new network. How are you going to mix this new data? That's not known. So what we are focusing on here is that your residual model can be decomposed into neural network function, which is based on the um, state. And whatever time-bearing disturbance maybe can be uh, characterized by different wind speed. W doesn't have to be the wind speed, but some function of wind speed or different wind profile. So you kind of separate that. It's much easier said than done. So what we are doing is that we came up with a new training method. And then before I say something about the training method offline, key thing is that how, how, was, is there a method that you can actually adopt these certain parameters in a real time? Yes, that's adaptive control. But adaptive control is conventionally tracking error based. It has nothing to do with uh, some of the gradient information from your learning errors. So that's why we are using composite adaptation. So adaptation, um, I mean, so the whole idea of this meta learning is that you have this adversary cost function. So before you do turn on the adaptive control, you have to condition the, your network so that all the state information can be captured by this neural network. And whatever time-bearing unknown wind-based parameters can be adopted and trained and relearned in real time, that's A. So that training method has been developed and successfully validated, uh, and including many other collaborators has been. Uh, so we share this uh, training code uh, in the science robotic paper supplemental material. So you can see that nice separation between this uh, wind speed. And then if you train the network like that, if you don't do this kind of adversarial like uh, uh, training, they're kind of mingled up. But you can see that nice separation between based on the different wind speed. So you can kind of feel the confidence that, oh, wow. Now, in, when you apply this in real time, you are just trying to estimate the A best you can. And that's adaptive control. And is that a statement is correct? No, because conventional adaptive control is a function of whatever parameter you have to adopt based on tracking error. So the A, parameter A vector, can jump to like a nonsensical number doesn't really capture the actual disturbance. That's, a, that's the really very uh, good characteristic of adaptive control. We don't care about the actually estimating the value. Adaptive control is about minimizing the tracking error. So I'm going to mention that. So this is our, our way of adaptive control and the neural network combination. So think about this. 
I said the deep neural network is so difficult to retrain because you don't have enough data and you don't have enough computer. You don't carry a compu uh, supercomputer because maybe this is a simple example. Who knows? Your deep neural network is uh, so multi-layered and so deep, you don't really cannot do back propagation in real time. Um, but here, what you are saying is that we only need to adopt the last layer, which can be done, even if you have 100 linear. And that has a resemblance to kind of a gradient vector minimization and then a policy gradient. Why? This one doesn't exist in conventional adaptive control. And this can be viewed as a parameter estimation. And some people say that this is another form of adaptive control, but different kind, just online system ID. So it was just amazing that um, uh, Zhang Zhak, his book, um, in my opinion, <laughs> many people were neglecting this beautiful result that Zhang Zhak had, where this is the estimation, G is the measurement. So you actually add the additional measurement error, which is minimizing the gradient. This is essentially gradient that I actually told you about. This you would see in the policy gradient or gradient descent. That term, then you add that with a tr conventional tracking error convergence uh, adaptation. So that's called composite adaptation. Obviously, we had to modify the some formulation and more importantly, prove the stability. You can see that this is a hierarchical system. Then you can see. Some, there is a typical adaptive control, you have a zero here, but you have a now um, gain term that can stabilize full. So here A, tilde is an error. So you are actually converging. Although you have a disturbance here, it tries to converge to the true value. Adaptive control doesn't do that. So it's a nice combination of a Kalman filter-like uh, measurement update, update and gradient descent and the tracking error. So that's the essence of a uh, uh, science robotics paper, neural fly. And then, of course, we kind of show that it's kind of a, a pump from the sum of the state of art. And now remember, this is just tracking control. You have to give some desired trajectory, but it can handle unknown dynamics. And then we actually wanted to move on to the uh, failed dynamics. So we could have a multiple propellers, but then some of the uh, propellers or motors um, can get stuck. And then a propeller could have a failure because of buzz about strike, and then you have to handle this failure. It turned out that if you just view that as a residual adaptation, neural fry was not the best performer. So what we actually have done is that we try to estimate this new influence matrix in the presence of failure because your B matrix will change in the presence of failure. So this is our flying ambulance model, and what's uh, unique about this kind of platform, people call it flying cars, and is a more technical jargon. It's called the urban air mobility system or advanced air mobility system. It's a combination of a fixed wing and the multi rotor because it can vertically take off and land and also fly longer distance as a fixed wing aircraft. And there is a nice, interesting transition flight that can cause a problem for stability and so on. So you assume that there are some failures, outer loop, uh, outer propeller, and so on. And it's called the minimal. So that's a paper that we recently uh, have this um, paper accepted. You can actually add a sensor to each propeller and observe, and then see whether there's a failure or not. And now you assume that some of the propellers has, sorry, a spacecraft has a 20, 30 thrusters, and you could have a many, many complicated actuators, and you don't know whether it's a coming from sensors. And it's gonna be expensive to add a sensor for just checking the failure. What you are doing is that no, we don't add any single uh, failure detection sensor, just detect based on observing adaptive control signal. Because why adaptive control? Neural fly? Because we have to stabilize it. And that's one of the disturbance you are going to have as a, um, a failure. But what you are doing is that in addition, we actually isolate and identify which propeller failed by just looking at the um, propeller. So this is a new result. And uh, the idea is that we slightly modify the um, a composite adaptation. So you kind of have an optimal uh, optimization loop um, that can actually, and also meeting the sparsity condition uh, using L1 uh, sparsity condition. So we are not doing L1 adaptive control. The idea is that try to make sure that your solution space is a sparse so that you can detect a complete failure. If you have a partial failure, it actually becomes easier. But if you have a complete failure, you want to make sure that there is no additional failure you have to detect, which is a force failure. And then so um, maybe I'm going to speed up. So uh, this one, 
What's interesting is that if you just turn off um, only, so you only do a neural fly or you just do a first tolerance to estimate the failed B matrix. This is a fantastic video where this is a Caltech campus, by the way. Um, so we don't really limit it to the indoor space. Now we started flying outdoors um, with a, G a differential GPS, or IT uh, ITK GPS. Anyway, it turned out that you, you combine this full tolerance estimation with a conventional neural fly where you can adopt additional disturbance coming from failure and wind. You have a best performance when you combine neural fly and port detection using L1 sparse uh, identification. So that's the result. And then I'm actually getting to the end. We started working on ground beakers. I told you about this Monte Carlo tree search based uh, motion planning that was outperforming in, uh, in some of our tests in some of the sequential convex or MPC based motion planning because it has an exploration power. You can actually back up and then you can kind of find the, some very novel path when you are really in a very complicated area. This is a JPL Mars yacht and I heard that this was the second fastest vehicle in the Mars yard. <laughs> because um, no, um, Mars rovers do not move that fast. So what we are doing here is that, in fact, it's not really that different from the, oops. Yeah, so maybe you don't have that, but this is a JPL. So we have an additional adaptation, but the input to the, uh, this adaptive control is not only state information, also you are using a visual foundation model, which is called the Dino V2. Anyway, this is kind of about classifying the soil where you are doing rock or carpet or sand, and using additional information, you can reduce the error, tracking error much more. And then, so this is the DAPA link project. Um, then we talked about the tight turning and so on, but it's not just motion planning because we are handling unknown track degradation here. So the operator, the organizer of this event, DAPA event, they intentionally modify control signal. And you know what? What I learned about this tracking controller is beautiful. We are very disappointed that I'm a tracking control person. I don't have an access to the access to the internal motor control loop. And it's almost like a server. You just need to command the uh, desired uh, is a skid steer, so you have a left wheel and right wheel speed. That's what you send, and you don't have access to the internal PID loop. And uh, how can I trust the internal PID loop? As a control engineer, I never trust some PID loop designed by, uh, tuned by other people. No, I'm just kidding. But turned out that luckily we could command that 100 hertz desired omega. So you know what we did? We actually closed the loop outside. And then we are actually doing that as a tracking control with a desired omega and work beautifully. It's even better than just uh, being able to control and tune the PID gains. So what I'm saying is that even though you have an internal unknown black box, real black box, you don't have an access. As long as you have a bandwidth, that can be treated as a unknown disturbance you have to estimate, which is very popular. Let's assume that you bought the Boston Dynamics spot robot somehow you don't have an access to the internal dynamics. So using our method, we are able to, not for the uh, spot, but for this vehicle, able to even adapt for unknown internal dynamics. And of course, the big disturbance is the unknown pendulum and also friction. And it's just surprising that. I thought that the aerodynamics is the biggest challenge of the whole physics world, because you don't really get the eject model. So that's why we are, for the control purpose, the neural network based approximation was good. It turned out that for ground vehicles, whole friction model is called like open world. I mean, people claim that this is a correct friction model. It's not gonna work. Still, there is a gap between true friction model and what we can predict out of an analytical model. So that's why it was actually a very nice approach. Um, so this is actually um, spacecraft simulator where we're doing the decision trees. Um, but I'm gonna just uh, move on to the uh, just acknowledgement. So final message, um, when you design this uh, motion planning and uh, we can actually add a machine learning block, uh, safety and stability guarantees are so important. So you have to be aware that such an important problem is there and also more importantly, there is a tool you can use to analyze some of the stability and safety and robustness here means that you converge and make it stable with respect to the certain bound, and you can maybe play with the bound. So robustness and stability go hand in hand. And I believe that safety should be added to the mix. 
So that's the um, uh, incremental stability theory I talked about. And then neural fry, this is the one way of doing rapid adaptation of uh, your complicated multi-layer deep neural network. You will never be able to retrain and then uh, do run the uh, stochastic gradient descent on in real time. At least we have a solution that you can do that using combination of uh, a composite adaptation and then uh, adversarial uh, meta learning. So I want to acknowledge some of my recent team members. I use uh, these people uh, highlighted in uh, 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 gray and I use their slides. And then of course, uh, Zhang Jack and some of my colleagues at Caltech and some of my recent graduates who are now faculty somewhere. So with that, thank you so much. Time for maybe a couple of questions. Let's see if uh, are there. Hi. Um, in my experience, the main challenge with safe control isn't really staying inside the safe set. So whether it's trajectory tracking or whatever else, it's knowing how to define the safe set without being really conservative. Yeah. So how do you how do you tackle so, that? So um, here, I think um, um, what I can do is that. Um, well, there are two approaches actually we are doing. In um, the video I didn't show you, um, although um, it's kind of a mix of the multiple approaches. I don't know why. The so one of the things that we can do is a sampling. So when you do some combination of sampling, so you can kind of simulate, because uh, Monte Carlo tree search is about the simulating the safety using known dynamics, which might be partially incorrect. So you actually reading the information is still better than nothing. So you actually simulate and um, like, uh, expand the trees, then check whether it's safe or not. So that way, you can also do back propagation like, a, like a Monte Carlo tree search does. And then you can actually adjust that. Another way of doing that, you have to directly estimate the safety bound as one of the parameters uh, you have to learn. Oh, I don't know why I don't see. Oh, I have to only show the. I wanted to show the video from the, no, not this one. Oh, yeah, it's going to be slow, but I'm going to let it play. But yeah, I don't know if I answered your question, maybe. <laughs> it's the same thing. Like uh, when I say contraction, then it's all about the exponential stability. Sometimes you have to make an effort to uh, compute the, your maximum disturbance. But it can be over not the infinity time. It could be a certain time horizon. And in addition, the reason why adaptive control is useful is that it's almost like a feedback cancellation. You can learn the additional residual term. So instead of trying that as an unknown disturbance, if you can cancel that out, your disturbance estimate will be further smaller. Do you agree? So that's why adaptive control is useful. Here, what we are doing is that in order to actually detect a port, we are doing tree-based kind of Bayesian active sensing. And then consider we have to avoid the collision with uh, this potato, which is actually our artificial asteroid. We actually sample the uh, decisions. It's almost like a, uh, a past planning. But we, whenever you actu decide which actuator you have to actuate to detect whether failure is, isolate whether failure is, um, it's just kind of long. But uh, eventually, you see the boundaries of safety. So we are doing also sampling-based approach. But that could be an alternative approach so that whenever you sample, you kind of exclude this. In this experiment, because the conventional thing oh. that is just not, it's not like that. It takes no action until it's pushed into it. Right. Yep. So in your cartoon of uh, your tracking controller staying safe by avoiding obstacles. Um, in that, the tr the trajectory that you take ends up going farther away from the trajectory that you're trying to stabilize to. So you're not really incrementally stable, at least certainly not in the L2 distance. So is there even a Riemannian metric that you know? No, Riemannian metric um, is more to do with uh, whatever known disturbance. Actually, whatever. Um, Comparison lemma actually starts from the zero disturbance. You show that in a perfect world, it's going to converge to zero. And then you start adding the disturbance. And then what I'm saying is that 
you have to make an effort. So you consider whatever maximum learning error you are doing in the two ways. Here you consider that error when you do an inequality definition. Uh, in addition, when you actually do a tracking, you can actually say like a tracking error, right? It could be, it's a function of time. That's the beauty of uh, exponential convergence as opposed to a lot of people are doing asymptotic, like a uniform of asymptotic input to state stability using class K function. Because your actual error is a function of time. You can just declare that this is good enough. You can just compute how much time or how much, how many steps, time step you need to get to the boundary. So, so you can so back propagate that. that. You have to be contracting at every point of the, at every point in time. So if you have to go farther away from your nominal trajectory at any point in order to stay safe, you're not actually contracting at no, every point. No, um, so this is actually a one example. Like uh, incremental stability is not about uh, uh, point-wise. Of course, you show the point-wise, like, uh, and that's converging. But incremental stability is that these trajectories are eventually um, exponentially converging. So you are looking at that overall behavior not just uh, occupied, preoccupied with uh, one single point. Because this is a desired trajectory. You are here at time uh, 10, and then time uh, 12, you are here. It's moving. So you are minimizing that error. That's the definition of incremental stability. There's no equilibrium point. Oh, hi, John. Thank you for coming. I was curious, like, you know, you, you have a slide about observer design, I think it's slide 37, but, you know, what are the implications on, uh, estima on the estimation side, instead of the control side, like, you know, what are the uses, like, you know, contraction theory for estimation, and uh, what are the guarantees that you get for the observer that you're presenting? 37? I think so, yeah. Let me go there. Oh, this one, stochastic. No? Is it? Uh, it's my favorite one, but... I think so, yeah, yeah. yeah so, so what are the guarantees, question? like, you know, on these, you know, do you get some guarantees on the observer, like, you know, what are the assumptions on the system? Oh, this is like, uh, you know, standard assumption, like, uh, Lipschitz, like, uh, you need to have a solution. So there is a standard bounded assumption on, uh, like, uh, Jacobian boundedness of, uh, I don't state that here, yes, but you need a bounded assumption on G uh, and so on, and also B, yeah. And under those assumptions, you guarantee that uh, the estimate the delta x is converging to zero? Oh, this is a perfectly known dynamics. Only uncertainty is actually this uh, we know process W1 and W2, or DW uh, over DT, which is actually white noise. That's the only thing that unknown. So of course, you can add a learning, like residual learning, deterministic learning there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's uh, your question? I think so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, by the way, we have a recent extension, actually. Uh, we could actually have a jump noise here. If this is like a Gaussian white noise. We can actually have a jump, and it's called actually a combination of jump and Gaussian noise. It's called the Levy process, and we should also show that uh, it actually works. Uh, we can prove the contraction there. And I think I have a few more, but you know, let's see if there are others here. Otherwise, I had uh, a curiosity about the, you had a distributed optimization, like you know, the local. Oh, yeah, that's uh, your ADM. expertise. I mean, uh, ADMM is, yeah, like, you know, I, I saw a um, post graph there, so <laughs> I have to ask, I guess. Um, ADMM, like, you know, is TV, like, you know, quite slow to converge yeah. here. So do you have comments here on the practical performance of the approach? So we, uh, this is actually um, exponential convergence for the um, centralized, I mean, not centralized, a more computationally extensive uh, problem than we have a local incremental version um, that where we really, uh, didn't focus on the stability proof on that, but more implementation side. Bec and, and that's like you know a post graph optimization problem yes. because you're assuming strong convexity, like you know, in, in uh, yeah. many right. factor graph optimization problems, like you know, which you have. Uh, yeah, so that's why um, uh, we actually also focus on the just convex and the um, and some like uh, uh, the uh, Lipschitz kind of assumption. Then we can actually prove the uh, convergence asymptotic. Unfortunately, it's not going to be exponential. Yeah. Okay, I think there is one last maybe. Thank you for the great talk. Uh, I had one question about the neural fly online adaptation. If I understood correctly, you're only adapting the last layer of the network to That's be right. fast. 
Um, are there limitations in expressiveness of the network? Have you found anything where, for example, um, mm. the domain shift was so large that you would have needed to also adapt to the lower level features? Yeah, so in fact, um, we actually are quoting a certain theorem there. Let me, actually this is, um, so uh, we actually showed it in the proof, uh, in the paper. Um, it's actually known wizard. Uh, let me sh go back to the uh, neural fly here. Um, one interesting aspect of this is that um, how many primers of A you are going to allow, uh, or allow for. I mean, so in fact, uh, if you have uh, the power of adaptation, um, I mean, I have given one example. So our adaptation looks like this. Again, uh, um, so it's uh, still quite sophisticated. Like uh, it, this is a conventional adaptive control. You can have a projection operator, and you can have a damping term here. But you actually have uh, this estimation error term, so that a can actually, or phi times a, more correctly, it's actually in the state space. Uh, so that should be kind of sizable and comparable to the actual disturbance. Um, but the dimension of V, this is, a, I mean, a input dimension and output dimension. So technically, if you have a, some superpower, A, I don't know how you do that. This is one example. But you have some super adaptation. You can technically have a, a really sufficiently large, right, to like, represent the uh, complicated uh, uh, function. So that would be my answer, uh, because you don't really, I don't present how you select the dimension of A vector. It's really your choice. Thank you. Yeah. All right, folks, we are uh, way past the hour, so let's thank Sunja right, again. Thank you so much. Yeah.